Hello and welcome to our webinar today. My name is Jessica Almy. I'm the Deputy Director of Nutrition Policy at the Center for Science in the Public Interest. And you've joined a webinar on our new Clean Labels report, which is called Clean Labels, Public Relations or Public Health. Um, please note there are a few things about today's webinar and logistics on the left-hand side of your screen. Also, we're recording today's webinar. And so if you miss part of it, um, or if you want to share it with colleagues, we will send you a, record, a link to the recording after the webinar. So I wanted to open up and um, explain why CSPI is interested in clean labels and what we've done with the report so far. And then I will introduce our speaker today, Lisa Lefferts, who will go into the findings of the report and the recommendations and take your questions. Um, your line is muted, so if you want to ask questions, you can use the chat box on the GoToWebinar control panel. CSPI initially decided to examine clean labels because we were often asked the question, do clean labels actually help public health? We work both on nutrition and on food additives, and so we wanted to look at these clean labels with a fresh perspective to see whether they do advance the health of the consumers that are asking for them and who buy them, or if they're more of a public relations stunt by the companies. Um, as Lisa will tell you in the as she goes through the findings of the report, we did find that clean label programs are promoting public health in various ways, but more can be done. When we released the report, we also released, we also launched a campaign for asking people to tweet at McDonald's, which is a company that has not adopted an extensive clean label report, clean label program, asking McDonald's to clean up their act and drop dyes, BHA, and aspartame which we thought were major priorities for that company, given their, the foods that they offer and what their ingredients look like right now. You'll see on your screen that there's a, a click to tweet link. If you type that in your browser, you can tweet to McDonald's, or you can just tweet clean up your act, comma, at McDonald's, and ask them to please drop dyes, BHA, and aspartame. We also reached out to many companies who are either mentioned in the report or are making progress on uh, clean labels, sharing the results of the report and our recommendations. And we've been engaging in some productive dialogue as a result of that, asking those companies to prioritize the additives that have the most meaning to people's health um, when adopting clean label programs. And as Lisa will talk about, the report talks about, looks at clean label programs in supermarkets and restaurants. Um, and we also have reached out to food companies that are in manufacturing foods and beverages. So with that, allow me to introduce Lisa Lefferts. She's a senior scientist here at CSPI, and she focuses primarily on food and color additives. She's the author of this report on clean labels, another called Being Red, Time for Action on Food Dyes, and several other CSPI reports. She has a bachelor's degree from Oberlin College and a master of science in public health from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She's worked in, for public interest organizations for the past two decades. Please join me in welcoming Lisa. Well, thank you, Jessica. And um, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Um, so this is a picture of the new report that Jessica was just uh, mentioning. Uh, most of you are familiar with Center for Science in the Public Interest. But for those who aren't, um, we're an independent, nonprofit consumer organization um, that focuses on food. And when I say independent, I mean that we don't accept any industry or government funding. Um, CSBI has been involved in evaluating the safety of food additives and advocating to get unsafe additives banned uh, since it was founded 46 years ago. In addition, of course, to doing a, a lot of other actions uh, to promote healthier food. So um, what are clean labels? There is no official definition of clean label, um, but generally it's interpreted to mean fewer artificial ingredients and more familiar ingredients. You'll often find claims like free from artificial colors and flavors, only natural ingredients, or no preservatives on clean label products. So this graph is a um, survey of consumers globally, um, and they were asked, what does the term clean label mean to you? And the most common answer was free from artificial ingredients. But you'll see on the, on the lowest bar um, that's colored blue that almost as many said, I don't know what clean label means. 
And others gave um, a variety of answers, anywhere from uh, thinking it meant natural or organic, um, or sh simple short ingredient lists, uh, et cetera. Since there's no official definition, um, it's understandable that there would be some confusion. So um, why, you know, why the interest in clean labels? Um, a recent survey by the International Food Information Council found that helpfulness, along with taste and price, are the biggest drivers of food purchasing decisions for most Americans. So it's really about an interest in healthy eating. And interestingly, limited or no artificial preservatives is a top way that Americans define healthy eating. Um, this graph shows the percent of consumers citing chemicals in food as a top food safety concern. So you can see how that um, has, has grown over the years. Again, this is um, from information from the International Food Information Council, their food and health surveys. So that um, concern has grown so that now uh, chemicals in food are consumers' top food safety concern. Um, so this slide, I've superimposed that graph along with the logos of companies of when they initiated their clean label programs. And um, you can see that um, companies are responding to this concern about chemicals in food by initiating uh, their clean label programs. Um, so, you know, where is this concern coming from? What's, what's it all about? There's a growing awareness of flaws in the system intended to ensure safety. Um, for example, um, FDA recommends but doesn't require specific testing. And too often, um, even those recommendations are not followed. A lot of people are surprised when they hear for the first time that not all substances added to food are approved by the government, uh, either the Food and Drug Administration or some other government agency. Some substances are deemed generally recognized as safe without FDA review. And FDA rarely reviews the safety of ingredients once they're in the marketplace, and rarely takes action to limit additives even when there's evidence um, to indicate that they're not safe. For example, um, nine recent reviews concluded that food dyes trigger adverse behavior in some children, but FDA hasn't, hasn't banned them or warned parents about that. And similarly, with aspartame, there are three um, studies indicating that aspartame causes cancer, but there's been no action um, on aspartame by FDA. So um, there are a number of cancer-causing chemicals in food. Um, and this isn't me or CSPI saying um, this. Actually, for RED3, BHA, and some artificial flavors, those have been determined to um, be carcinogenic by US government agencies. So for example, um, BHA is considered reasonably anticipated to be a human carcinogen by Health and Human Services. FDA banned RED3 for certain uses in uh, cosmetics and externally applied drugs, but most uses in food, ironically, um, are still on the table. And similarly, um, some artificial flavors have been identified by the National Toxicology Program or other agencies uh, to cause cancer. So um, we saw earlier that some consumers think that um, organic, that clean label means organic. So is certified organic clean label? What do you think? Well, <laughs> the answer is uh, yes. Uh, certified organic is clean label, and it's a lot more than that. Um, there are clear standards defining what, um, what are certified organic products, but there aren't any official standards for clean label. Um, certified organic products are produced with natural substances as a general rule, with any exceptions spelled out in the standard. Um, clean label products may or may not be produced with synthetic substances. Um, it, some of them make other um, production claims, but if they don't, um, there's no guarantee. 
Um, and standards, um, the certified organic standards identify what um, synthetic substances are permitted to be used in processed organic foods. Again, there's no standards, uh, official standards for clean label products, um, but rarely some clean labels exclude a substance allowed in organic processed foods. The only example I could find was sodium phosphate. So um, we know that an interest in health is uh, driving food purchasing decisions for, for many consumers. But are clean label products healthy? Well, it's important to put clean labels in perspective. To the extent that clean labels are made with more actual foods instead of cheap chemical imitations, then that certainly is a step in a healthy direction. However, just because there's an absence of, of certain artificial ingredients doesn't turn an unhealthy food into a healthy one. Uh, a clean label product could still be loaded with salt, added sugar, saturated fat, or be largely devoid of nutrients. So who has these clean label foods? Um, our report looked at um, a number of uh, supermarkets and restaurants that had eliminated um, many specific chemicals from, um, from their clean label products. So um, we looked at um, Aldi, Food Lion, Giant, HEB, Kroger, Meyer, ShopRite, Stop and Shop, Super Value, and Target. And you can see um, they have specific clean label brands that have eliminated many specific chemicals. Often these have names, have the word nature or simple um, in the name, like nature's promise, nature's place, simply nature, simple truth, etc. We also looked at four restaurants, um, Chipotle Mexican Grill, Noodles and Company, Panera Bread, and Papa John's. Um, and they have eliminated also many specific chemicals from most of their products. Um, some supermarkets, um, namely Whole Foods and Trader Joe's, have store-wide programs eliminating chemicals. It's not just confined to one or, or several brands. And then, of course, there are manufacturers um, like Campbell's, General Mills, Kellogg, and Nestle USA that have eliminated some artificial ingredients. Um, artificial colors and artificial flavors are, are common ones that manufacturers have eliminated. Um, Campbell's has also eliminated um, some artificial sweeteners and artificial preservatives. And then some manufacturers have eliminated many artificial ingredients. Um, Panera at Home eliminates the same long list of chemicals from the Panera at Home products as it does from the uh, restaurant items in Panera Bread. And then also um, Lara Bar and That's It eliminate many artificial ingredients. So um, what do we make of all these chemicals in food? One estimate says that there are over 10,000 chemicals added to food. Some of these are ones that you'll find on the label. Some of them you won't find on the label. Some are approved by FDA. Some aren't approved by FDA and instead determined to be generally recognized as safe by uh, another private entity. Um, some are, are used in packaging or to process food. So where do you begin with, with all of that? Um, CSBI has um, come up with a, a list of recommended priorities for addressing food ingredients in clean label programs. And so we identified four tiers of priority ingredients. Our top tier, um, because they pose major health concerns, the excessive amounts consumed and the number of people affected are added sugars and added salt. Um, very familiar ingredients, but ones that pose, um, that cause more harm than probably all the others put together. Um, we recommend, we rate both of those as cut back. Again, a little bit's fine, but most Americans consume way too much. Um, in tier two, we've put um, a number of additives that we rate as avoid. We, we recommend consumers avoid these because they pose a small risk 
of a serious adverse effect, for example, cancer. So in this category, we have uh, synthetic dyes like red 40, yellow 5, yellow 6, blue 1, um, some artificial flavors, not all. Of course, when you look on the label, it just says artificial flavorings. It doesn't tell you which artificial flavorings. Um, some, not all, artificial sweeteners, um, namely aspartame, saccharin, sucralose, and acesulfame potassium. Um, some, again, not all, artificial preservatives. Um, most of these are listed for, because of cancer concerns, uh, includes BHA, um, nitrates and nitrites used in cured meats, whether they're from natural or artificial sources, propylgallate and TBHQ, uh, partially hydrogenated vegetable oils, and the meat substitute mycoprotein um, sold under the brand name corn, which has been linked to many adverse um, reactions, including even some deaths. In our third uh, tier of priority, we listed um, additives that pose a slight or possible risk of a serious adverse effect. Um, and these we rated mostly as either avoid or caution. Um, they include the rest of the artificial flavorings, uh, as well as natural flavorings, which um, also can substitute for nutritious ingredients, as you see in that last column. Um, some other artificial colorings, namely um, certain caramel colorings because of the presence of a carcinogenic contaminant, um, the preservative BHT, some bread and flour additives, um, azodicarbonamide, which maybe you remember being called the yoga mat um, chemical, um, potassium bromate, and the others are listed there. Again, some of these um, not only have a a slight or possible risk of an effect, but may also uh, substitute for nutritious ingredients. And in our tier four, we've put ones that are poorly tested or are concerned for certain people because they can trigger acute um, allergic or hypersensitivity reactions. So for example, in this tier, we have things like MSG, um, the artificial colorings that are derived from natural sources, annatto, which comes from a seed, um, cochineal extract, or carmine, which comes from an insect, and uh, a few other additives. I want to talk just a little bit now about one of our tier two ingredients, which is synthetic food dyes. Again, these are those numbered colors like blue 1 and uh, red 40, red 3. Um, we're particularly concerned about synthetic food dyes. For one thing, of course, they serve um, only a cosmetic function. There's no, absolutely no nutrition or health function or benefit. In fact, um, dyes are often used to mask the absence of or displace colorful fruits and vegetables which works you know, against a healthy product. So you know, think of uh, the cherry berry um, juices that don't have any cherries or berries, just red 40. Um, in this report, Seeing Red, Time for Action on Food Dyes that we issued last year, um, we discussed the evidence linking synthetic food dyes with adverse behavior uh, in some children. So a majority of double-blind trials and three uh, recent meta-analyses support a link between food dyes and adverse behavior in some children. And of course, um, synthetic food dyes are completely unnecessary. They don't need to be used at all. Um, there are safer substitutes that can be used or just no, no added color whatsoever. In Europe, um, the label uh, may have an adverse effect on activity and attention in children is required on foods containing any one of a number of, the, of synthetic dyes, including the three that uh, we in the United States use, that are, are, are most used in food. That's red 40, yellow 5, and yellow 6. 
Now, as a result of this requirement of a warning label, many companies reformulated their products for the European market to avoid having to put the warning label on. They took out the dyes, but they sell the very same product in the United States with dyes because there's no warning label requirement here. So here's a little quiz for you. Um, which chocolate milkshake has synthetic food dyes? McDonald's or Dairy Queen? They look pretty much the same. You might have guessed it's McDonald's um, is the one that contains Red 40, both in the maraschino cherry and in the shake syrup. The Dairy Queen chocolate shake doesn't have any synthetic dye. Just one illustration of many of how it's really not necessary to use those chemicals. So um, turning to the findings of our report, we found that of the programs that we evaluated, um, the clean label products eliminate many worrisome ingredients. Um, many of the, of the tier two um, priority ingredients and some of the others. Um, clean label products also eliminate many ingredients that CSPI rates as safe. Now, we don't really have a problem with that. If they're not needed, that's fine to eliminate them, and they may be helping to prop up a, a, an unhealthy food. But it's also important to realize that not all chemicals uh, that are eliminated from clean label products are worrisome. We also found that the, for the clean label restaurants that we examined that eliminate long lists of, of, of um, ingredients, those generally don't apply to all of their beverages. They still serve drinks with unwanted ingredients. Now that's really important because beverages are a major source of some of the worst ingredients, particularly added sugars, um, but also synthetic dyes and artificial sweeteners such as aspartame. We also found that um, clean label is not the same thing as healthy. That may be what's driving consumer interest in clean labels, but um, not all clean label products are healthy. I'm not meaning to pick on these two companies, but these are just two examples. Um, Whole Foods 365 Cola has more sugar than Coke or Pepsi even, and more than you should consume in a day. Um, many of Panera Bread's soups have um, high levels of sodium. For example, their Bistro French Onion Soup has 85% of the daily sodium limit and half a day's worth of saturated fat. Um, you may recall from that earlier slide that some people think that uh, clean, label, clean labels are um, products with short and simple um, ingredient lists, but many clean label foods um, are not short, don't have short or simple ingredient lists. For example, this is the ingredient list from Kroger's Simple Truth Fudge Graham Nutrition Bar, which lists six forms of sugar alone in a long list of ingredients. I'd also like to make the point that um, just because an ingredient is familiar doesn't mean that it's safe. And just because an ingredient is unfamiliar doesn't mean that it's unsafe. So for example, Everybody's heard of salt and sugar, um, and most of us have heard of partially hydrogenated oil. Um, we call those the terrible three because they have caused so much harm to public health. Um, on the other hand, um, some chemicals that may sound, uh, some additives that may sound um, you know, unfamiliar, like calcium propionate or calcium steroid lactylate, um, we rate as safe. Those can even add a little calcium. So um, when we were evaluating the different clean label programs, we looked at three criteria. Um, first, we looked at the ingredients covered. And we wanted to know if the program was excluding the most um, important additives from a public health perspective. Also, looking at product coverage. Um, are all the products sold by the company covered, or just a few? Um, and then also transparency. Does the company make detailed information about its product and clean label commitments publicly available? 
Um, and this shows, um, you know, all of these again are are leading clean label programs, and they've they all eliminate um, many, although not all, of the most worrisome ingredients. Um, Chipotle Mexican Grill uh, gets a slightly higher mark on the ingredients than most of the other companies. Um, it is the only restaurant that um, doesn't um, serve processed meats containing either natural or artificial sources of nitrates or nitrites. Also, it was the only company examined that does not use natural flavors. And Whole Foods got slightly less than the others because uh, it sells corn um, uh, or microprotein and a few other uh, ingredients that we um, had on our tier two list. In terms of product coverage, um, you'll see that Whole Foods, um, because it's a store-wide program, scored very well there. Um, most of the other supermarkets um, got one star because uh, generally it was only one brand or one product line. Aldi, um, however, got two stars because although uh, only one of its brands uh, excludes many uh, chemicals, um, all of its private label brands exclude a number of ingredients, some ingredients. So, um, so that's great. And transparency, we were looking for uh, which companies provided clear, specific, comprehensive online information on both their clean label programs as well as nu nutrition and ingredients for all products. So um, some do and some don't. So um, turning to our recommendations, um, we think it's important to prioritize public health beyond clean labels. So that means um, not only eliminate additives that are either unsafe, poorly tested, or that substitute for nutritious ingredients, and we've you know, provided uh, our guidance on which we think those are, but it's also important to improve the overall nutritional quality, limit sodium and added sugars, not to market sugar drinks or unhealthy foods to kids, and ensure that the majority of products meet reasonable limits on calories, added sugars, sodium, saturated fat, and include fruits, vegetables, and whole grains. Also, um, we recommend that these programs be comprehensive. They should apply to all products um, a company makes or sells. So for example, um, it's important to, to bring beverages on, into all beverages into clean label programs that are offered by restaurants. And we'd like to see um, supermarkets expand their um, clean label programs to all of their private label brands, if not store-wide. And um, it's important to be transparent. Uh, it's so helpful to somebody who, who wants or, or, or needs to avoid a particular ingredient if the company discloses the specific substances on their no-no list and doesn't just say something like no, artif you know, no artificial preservatives, which it's not really clear what they're, what they're including and what they're not. And also for restaurants to provide complete ingredient and nutrition information for all menu items, both on site and online and for supermarkets to provide this information online. More and more people are shopping online or might be consulting um, that information in, in preparing their, um, their shopping lists. As Jessica mentioned, um, we had a click to tweet campaign um, at, on the same day that we released the report, um, which uh, was very successful in generating a lot of tweets from McDonald's and we hope will ultimately be successful in getting McDonald's to take a look at its labels. So if you're interested to learn more about some of the chemicals that we were prioritizing in the report, or if you just pick up a food product and it has some uh, additive listed and you think, what the heck is that, and you wonder if it's something you should be avoiding, I'd like to direct you to our Chemical Cuisine website where we, um, we rate the safety of different additives. And this is just based on our independent view of the science, um, no other considerations. Um, and the ratings go from safe, the additive appears to be safe, um, 
through to avoid um, where we feel that it is uh, unsafe in amounts consumed or just not worth the risk. And you can see the other uh, rating symbols that we use there. I'd like to acknowledge um, my colleagues. Um, Dr. Michael Jacobson has been looking into the safety of food additives even before he founded uh, CSPI 46 years ago. Um, you've already been introduced to Jessica Almi, Deputy Director of Nutrition Policy, who helped with um, uh, formulating and editing the report. Uh, Jeff Cronin, Director of Communications, who um, helped to edit the report. Deborah Brink and George Bach, who did a great job on the design. And also Sarah Fuchs, um, our wonderful intern. So here I've provided um, some contact information for myself and for CSPI. Also, uh, there's going to be a Food Friday tweet chat on February 24th, if you're interested in that. And I'd just like to thank you um, very much. And at this time, turn uh, things back to Jessica to, um, and, and feel free to ask any questions you have. We'll take those now. Jessica? Hi, Lisa. We have a bunch of questions from the audience. Thank you all for submitting your questions and keep them coming. We still have another 14 minutes on the webinar, so we should be able to get to most, if not all, of them. Um, Lisa, one of the questions we got is about the companies that were included in this report and our plans to include other companies in a future report. The person who's asking the question says that Earth Fair has a rather extensive avoid list and has a store-wide approach. And um, the person who's asking if they're going to be included in a future study. So would you talk a little bit about what the uh, criteria were for inclusion in this particular report and what you think might happen next? Well, I think we would like to, um, you know, revisit this issue in the future, um, resources permitting. Um, we were mainly looking at companies that were, you know, major supermarket chains and, and major restaurant chains that had um, committed to eliminating um, a large number of chemicals from their products. We wanted to see which chemicals those were. Um, we were aware of some um, smaller um, companies or programs um, that were doing a great job, but we were looking at more major um, companies. I did not know that uh, about the one you just mentioned, and perhaps that's one we could include in the future. Do you have anything to add to that, Jessica? No, I think that's right, um, and I and appreciate the tip. Definitely noting that, and I'm on Earth Fair's website right now, and I see they have a number of locations throughout um, everywhere from Michigan down to Florida. So we'll take a look next time we're writing a report like this. Thank you for the tip. Um, another question asks, you said that red three and some artificial flavors cause cancer, but CSPI ranks added sugar and salt as higher priorities. Why is that? Well, uh, Jessica, you might be able to answer that question better than I can, but when you look at um, the number of people affected and, um, you know, the risks that those additives pose. Um, for example, the, the risk from RED3, uh, RED3 is not a very commonly used food dye. Um, so um, there's not a lot of exposure to RED3. So it's important to consider how much of the additive is being consumed. Contrast that with, sh with the excessive amounts of sugar and salt in the food supply. Um, and same with the artificial flavors. Um, it's hard to get usage data on artificial flavors, but um, those are used in, in quite small amounts. So the risk would really pale next to the risk um, from, from added sugars and, and, um, and sodium. Yeah, I would just kind of highlight the, the risk that heart disease and diabetes pose to most Americans and the, and the fact that a lot of, um, a lot of what we know about ha what people's uh, rates of chronic disease and early death are, is, are linked to sort of the, the nutrients like added sugars and sodium in their diet. Um, so we, we prioritize those more highly because they affect more people and they can have really um, dramatic effects. Um, so there's a question about 
uh, whether, and this question came in before you talked about chemical cuisine, Lisa, so maybe chemical cuisine is the answer to it, but the person asks, um, is there a list of additives that are safe and maybe necessary for food safety or to extend the shelf life of a product? It's a great question. Um, so in the chemical cuisine website where we give the ratings of um, different additives, the most common rating we give is a safe rating. Um, we think most additives are safe. And um, you know, there are one of the things we mentioned in the report is it's important when companies are developing these lists of chemicals they want to eliminate to make sure they're not, um, you know, that there's not an unintended consequence from doing that. Take um, sodium acid pyrophosphate, which can reduce um, the levels of acrylamide, a carcinogen, in French fries. So you know, that's one additive you might want to keep in your French fries if you're eating French fries. Um, so uh, in terms of preservatives, you'll see that um, it's common that some products, you know, the very same kind of product, there'll be one that has uh, preservatives and another that doesn't. There's usually safer alternatives uh, to preservatives. Um, so it's, it's an important question, and it kind of gets to the point that you know, certainly not all of these um, additives are ones that we need to be concerned about. Lisa, on your slides that talked about more than 10,000 chemicals in food, some were characterized as grass. What are substances that are generally recognized as safe, and are they really safe? Um, so, for example, um, you know, there's there's quite a few, um, and um, monk fruit extract uh, is an example of a of a grass chemical, um, and there's just not a lot of data on it. It might be perfectly safe, but you know, it's just not been well tested. It's um, coming from something that's been in the you know food supply in another part of the world for a long time, and it's you know might be just fine, but. Uh, we're just a little uneasy when we don't have much data to, to base, um, you know, to, to base an evaluation on. Then there's chemicals like caffeine, um, which is complex. Um, FDA has, FDA at one point made its own determinations of what was generally recognized as safe, and only in more recent years sort of let companies make those determinations. But um, FDA determined that caffeine was generally recognized as safe in certain uh, cola and other sodas. But since then, the use of caffeine has proliferated in energy drinks and in other products where it may not be generally recognized as safe. And in fact, um, there's a lot of concern about um, uh, emergency room visits um, linked to energy drinks that are, you know, could well be from uh, the caffeine. So um, there's quite a few, more and more new substances added to the food supply are, um, are being designated generally recognized as safe. They're supposed to have the same quality and quantity of safety evidence as other food additives. But let me tell you, they don't. <laughs> so um, that, that is really a concern. And companies don't want to go through the long process of trying to get FDA approval of an additive when they can simply, you know, get a panel of scientists together to say, yep, this is generally recognized as safe, and not even tell FDA about it, um, or possibly tell FDA about it, but FDA doesn't necessarily pass judgment on um, whether it agrees. It'll just say if it has any questions or not. So that's kind of a long answer to your question. Um, not all generally recognized as safe substances are safe in our in our view. Okay, we have a question that is generally about a product that has a healthy profile but has a very small amount of an additive that this guy is concerned about. The person mm -hmm. asks, what if a product has low saturated fat, low, low added sugar, high quality plant protein, and low sodium, and may or may not use caramel color in very minimal amounts. Would you consider this an unclean product, and why, if it's healthy? Well, OK, there's no official definition, but um, you know, I, I would think that sounds like a pretty healthy product to me. Um, it, now, there are different types of caramel coloring, and only some contain the carcin 
carcinogenic um, contaminant of concern. <clears throat> so it would be even better if you know if caramel color just absolutely had to be used if they used um, organic caramel coloring or a form of caramel coloring that didn't contain that carcinogenic contaminant because you know who needs to have any any carcinogens in their food supply even if um, in very small amounts it's just those shouldn't be there um, so you know caramel coloring is not is not one of our tier two or tier one ingredients um, so it sounds like a you know a pretty good product yeah and generally we would prefer that products have good macronutrient profiles and be kind of healthier you know there's a reason that we prioritized added sugar and sodium over the other ingredients um, that are in this report so I think you know it's important to keep in mind that the you know the building blocks of a good diet are fruits, vegetables, whole grains, like you said, Lisa, and you know, reducing saturated fat, sodium, added sugars. Um, okay, some more questions. Are there any efforts underway to develop clean label programs for school foods? Oh, I'm so glad you asked that question. Um, yes. <laughs> We've worked with a number of schools <clears throat> and school organizations like School Food Focus and Real Food for Kids who have really been active on this issue. For example, School Food Focus has developed an ingredient guide for better school food purchasing that identifies ingredients of concern. And that's already being successfully used in Chicago Public Schools and Minneapolis Public Schools and probably um, elsewhere in the country as well. And at the School uh, Food Focus National Gathering, there was a lot of um, interest in this issue and a lot of vendors were touting their clean label products in the exhibition hall. Um, and Real Food for Kids, I know, has, has done a lot of work in Maryland and Virginia and Georgia um, to eliminate uh, unwanted ingredients from schools there. Lisa, I've got two questions about nitrates and nitrates. And one is easy and one is hard. So I'll start you with the softball. If the label of a lunch says no nitrites or nitrates added, would it meet your recommendation? And just hold on, there's a harder one coming. Um, that's an excellent question and one that we get a lot. And the short answer is no. Um, no nitrates or nitrates added is, a, is really a, a pretty deceptive claim, even though it's legal. It can mean that the product still contains nitrates um, that are added from natural sources, such as celery powder. The nitrate generally is converted to nitrite during the processing. And natural cured meat you know, from natural sources can have even more nitrite than meats cured with sodium nitrite. Um, so the, sort of the bottom line is that processed meats, such as bacon and hot dogs, sausage, are classified um, as carcinogenic to humans by the International Agency for Research on Cancer, which is an arm of the World Health Organization, based on many studies um, in people that found that consumption of processed meat causes colorectal cancer. So your best bet is to just avoid processed meat. Okay, so and that the actually, yes, the hard question was, are you effectively advocating for no lunch meats and hot dogs if natural sources are not appropriate? And it sounds like your answer is yes. Well, um, you know, again, if you, it, um, because of that link with colorectal cancer, we, we recommend that you avoid those products altogether. Okay. Another it's question a, about it's also a question of quantity. I mean, the you know, an occasional, uh, you know, the, the more you know, the more that's consumed, the the more that the risk will, the higher the risk. So, um, if you want to give yourself an occasional treat and take a small risk, okay, you know, but we're just just be aware that there is that risk. Okay, with one minute left on the clock, I'll ask you one last question. And if folks have further questions, they can get in touch with us uh, at the email addresses that are on, their, on your screen right now. So the last question is, which of the Tier 2 ingredients are you most concerned about? Um, I'd say that um, synthetic food dyes, aspartame, and mycoprotein would probably be at the top of my list. Um, Partially hydrogenated vegetable oil would have topped the list in the past, but fortunately that's 
or on the way out of the food supply. Um, the dyes, um, not only because they pose risks to sensitive individuals, and not only do some synthetic dyes have cancer concerns, although it's, they're pretty small, um, you know, as I mentioned, they substitute for real nutritious ingredients um, and are often used to deceive consumers, and they're just so unnecessary. Um, aspartame, because of the strength of the evidence um, that it can cause cancer, and the cancer risk appears to be larger than one would expect. And microprotein, fold under the name uh, corn with a Q, because it has been linked to deaths and serious adverse reactions. Thank you so much for your presentation today, Lisa. I would encourage everyone who's joined today's webinar to join our tweet chat. We'll be using hashtag Food Friday, and it will be on February 24th from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Please join us on Twitter at that time to have a more continue the conversation around clean labels. And thank you all for joining us today. Yes, thank you so much.